Hello guys! As I mentioned in earlier episodes, there are millions and millions of audio devices like these old radios or cassette players out in the world and they are often no longer in use because at least the younger generation prefers to listen to mp3s or maybe to YouTube and other modern digital media. The thing is though that these old radios and sound systems actually come with about 90% of the technology needed to be connected to these modern devices as well. And that is why I made a video in which I showed how I added line-in connectors to these old radios in the year 2014. I later then also made a video about my old car radio which I also upgraded so that a smartphone could be connected to it via first an inline connector and then later in another video via a Bluetooth receiver that I added to that radio. And after that I also made an episode where I took another old car stereo or car radio and built an entire home stereo system around that. And you can see here on the back side that it has simply a multi-purpose inline connector with RCA. And here in the front you can see a small PCB and that is actually a cheap Bluetooth receiver that I also added to that home stereo. And in this episode I'm going to hack yet another old stereo system. This time it's a compact stereo system with separate audio loudspeaker boxes. And I need that for personal reasons that I will explain in another video that will go online soon. In this video I will try to do my best to document the process and hopefully some people will copy that idea. And all of those four older episodes that I just mentioned can be found in the video description of this video. And I really recommend to watch all of those videos in addition to this one because they can really help you to see more examples of this hack and better understand why it even works. Okay, so let's first take a look at the outside of this compact stereo system. We can see that it has two cassette drives also an FM and AM radio receiver, it has equalizer potentiometers and of course a volume control part. And the second question that I want to answer is how do you get your hands on something like this? Well I can only speak for my country and here in Germany it is extremely easy. You go on eBay Kleinanzeigen which is as much as eBay small ads and there they have a special category called Zufaschenken which means for free. And if you browse through that and do that on a regular basis, I assure you that you will find something either for free or for a couple of euros. Now this device has detachable loudspeaker boxes like a real home stereo system. But it could also be used as a mobile boom box of sorts and that's why it has a battery compartment. And these old cells here are still saying made in West Germany and that means that they were manufactured before 1990. So I'm pretty sure that this whole thing might be about 25, 26 years old at least. Okay, so in the meanwhile I have unscrewed a couple of screws from the enclosure in order to open up the stereo system. And if you want to do that yourself, you most probably will need a very long Phillips type screwdriver. And we can now take a first look inside. We see the back side of the cassette drives and on the left side of the PCB, visually limited by this white line, we can see the radio receivers. And that part of the circuit is easily recognizable by the large ferrite rod antenna and all these small filters and coils. You will not really see any inductive components in the low frequency section of this device at all. The one obvious exception is of course this mains transformer here that marks where the power supply is located. And here you can see the rectifier diodes on the secondary side of the transformer that lead to this large electrolytic capacitor here. And right in the middle of this PCB we find this integrated circuit here inside an old fashioned dual inline package. And it is very close to these two shielded audio wires that are coming from the cassette drives. And because of the closeness of these two things, we can be quite sure that this is the cassette drive's preamplifier. And as I will explain later in this video, finding this preamplifier is very important for this hack. And there is yet one more important integrated circuit up here in the right corner. 
and this time realized in a single inline package and that is this stereo system's power amplifier. Okay, so I have talked about and shown you the most important parts of such a stereo system and I hope that it will help you to identify these components on your own PCBs at home. But we still have to talk a little bit about how they are connected and how it all works as a whole. Now, talking about this on a circuit diagram level would indeed be very complicated and very complex and it would also not be very applicable to other sound systems than the particular one that I'm having here on my desk. You also will have a hard time finding the actual circuit diagrams for many of these cheaper compact stereo systems. So instead of looking at a particular circuit diagram, I have drawn a block diagram that simply represents a very general idea of what you can find inside a typical sound system of this type. So don't take it too literal and also expect that your device at home will vary in one point or another from what I have lying on my workbench here. And no, you do not have to understand everything that I'm about to say for this hack, but please just stick with me and take a look at it. So let's start with the power supply then, which is of course directly connected to the power grid and the voltage, the line voltage of your grid can of course vary depending on which country you're living in. And directly after these power leads leading into the device, you will often have, at least with older models, a mains switch on the primary side of the transformer that is about to follow. That switch can also be a relay or it can also be that you have a device that has no primary side switches at all, but only like transistor switches on the secondary side of the power supply. Following the main switches, you will then often find a fuse that leads to the primary side of a 50 or 60 hertz mains transformer. So normally in these older models and probably also in the newer ones, you will not find a switch mode power supply, but a conventional mains transformer based power supply that is operated at the frequency of the line voltage. Depending on how well made or how complicated your device is, you will find one or more than one secondary windings. These secondaries are then typically followed by a bridge rectifier that can be either an integrated part or implemented as four discrete diodes, as it is the case right here as we have seen earlier. Connected to the rectifier bridge you then often find a large electrolytic capacitor. And in these compact stereo systems you also often have a battery compartment and some kind of battery selector switch that will allow you to switch between grid powered and battery powered operation. And as you can see here, I called this pin here VCC1 and I said that it could have something between 9 volts and 30 volts DC, but that is just a ballpark figure. It can be both lower or higher than that. And you will often find also some kind of linear regulator. In this case, I have drawn a 7805. That's a fixed vo output voltage, 5 volt linear regulator. And sometimes you will find that on the PCB. And also in my earlier videos about this topic, I sometimes added such a linear regulator to the existing circuitry in order to power the Bluetooth receiver that we will talk about later. So much about the power supply, let's talk about the actual audio electronics then. These compact systems will have loudspeakers either internally or externally and at least if there are actually really stereo devices you will have at least two of them and that's why it says here times two. Connecting the loudspeakers to the power amplifier, you often find large electrolytic capacitors that act as filter capacitors. But sometimes you don't have them. It depends on the type and the topology of the power amplifier. And here we have the power amplifier, the capacitor and the loudspeaker. And that would actually be the most basic thing that you would need to attach your smartphone to, for example. And you could simply do that by attaching the sound output of your earphone plug or whatever of your smartphone directly to the input of the power amplifier and of course also to the ground of that amplifier. But that would have the disadvantage that you couldn't use the internal volume control potentiometer of the stereo system. The same is true for the audio filters in this case realized as equalizers as well. So if you wanted to use the actual audio filters and volume control, you would have to connect your external sound source, in this case for example smartphone, 
before the audio filters. And that is where the source selector comes into play. Now with really old devices you might just have a rotary switch and that is actually beautifully simple and can easily be hacked. But in this type of sound system you will have some kind of transistor based selector circuit that will be activated when the little switch that you can see on the bottom of it is either closed or opened. And at the input side of that selector circuit you will have of course your radio receiver and on the other hand the preamplifiers of your cassette drives. And of course there are some minor things missing here, for example the electronic clock inside this stereo system and your stereo systems at home might have all kinds of additional gadgets. But here are pretty much the most important building blocks of these things. If you had an additional CD drive, for example, that source selector would simply have a third connection then, for example. So what kind of changes entails the little modification that I'm going to show you? First of all, the direct signal path from the output of the cassette preamplifiers to the source selector circuit is disconnected. And instead of that, switches that are to be installed on the front panel are inserted here so that it is possible to optionally cut off or reconnect the preamplifiers to the source selector. And second, there is a switch that activates the source selector itself and that is normally done when you push the play button on one of the tape decks. And for that we also need a switch on the front panel that would enable us to activate the source selector actively without using the cassette deck at all. We will then install RCA connectors on the back side of the stereo system and connect those as general purpose line ins directly to the input of the source selector. Next, our Bluetooth receiver will be installed inside the enclosure and its audio outputs will be directly connected to the line in path. And yet another switch, this time coming from the Bluetooth receiver will be installed on the front panel and that can be used to switch the Bluetooth receiver on and off. And this time I'm then going to install an additional 5V USB power supply inside the enclosure to power the Bluetooth receiver so that it has a completely independent power supply from the internal power supply. I did this differently in my earlier videos about this topic, but I'm not going to repeat that, just watch the older videos as well. So guys, as you can see, the whole hack that I've been talking about in theory for the last 13 minutes has actually already been implemented. But the thing is that I needed this entire day to do the editing on this first video and it's already too long in my opinion to put another 15 minutes or so on top of that. And I'm also kind of tired right now and it's already evening and so on. So I decided to upload this in two parts and I promise that the second part with all the practical stuff will go online then tomorrow. And if you found this interesting, please check out that second video as well. And I hope you like this and see you tomorrow then.